Welcome to another edition of Rivers of Possibilities. Today, we take a look at the century-old city of Fort Harcourt, popularly known as the Garden City, which is gradually being marred by poor urban planning and congestion. I'm Onyi Sunday. Thanks for joining us. Port Harcourt is the capital of River State, located in Nigeria's Niger Delta region. It lies right along the Bunny River. It was named Port Harcourt in 1913 by then Governor of Nigeria, Sir Frederick Lugard, in honor of Lewis Vernon Harcourt, who was then the Secretary of State for the Colonies. The port from where it got its name was built in 1912 to export coal from the collieries of Enugu State, located 151 miles north of Port Harcourt. The city's status changed from a transport route to a petroleum hub in 1956, with the discovery of commercial quantities of crude oil at Oloibiri. With the first shipment of Nigerian crude oil in 1958, Port Harcourt was developed further, with the modernization of road transport networks and urban planning. In 1914, records show that Port Harcourt covered an area of 15.54 square kilometers. Today, it has a population of over 1.3 million people, according to 2006 census figures. Port Harcourt's growth is attributed to its position as the commercial centre and foremost industrial city of the former Eastern region and its importance as the centre of social and economic life in River State. The city has a large number of multinational companies as well as other industrial concerns, particularly business related to the petroleum industry. It is also one of Nigeria's major oil refining cities. By generating jobs in the petroleum sector, its status as the oil and gas hub brought a downside. A population explosion and uncontrolled expansion of the city ensued, distorting the original urban design of the city and losing the scenery that earned it the title of the Garden City. A drive around the city shows the severity of the distortion. Between, um, let me say, 1980, when there was a boom in the oil industry and then escalation of oil factory, oil industry, the crude oil uh, industry in Port Harcourt, citing its offices in Port Harcourt. Then influx of people into the Port Harcourt uh, city led to increase in demand for housing. And that increase now led to the point at which the planning now went wrong because when you move beyond uh, mile two, mile three to the rumors, now you'll see that because of the pressure, people were just building, 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 and so that's where we lost it. Some of Port Harcourt's most popular and well known residential areas are the Port Harcourt Township, the government reserved areas, Rumor Massey, D Line, and Amadi Flats. An area known as Trans Amadi was earmarked as an industrial layout. Most of these areas still retain a semblance of proper planning. Accepting that the city's expansion has spiraled out of control, the government embarked on the building of a new city known as the Greater Port Harcourt City. Port Harcourt City exists. Port Harcourt City is growing. But we want to control how it grows. If you observe, the city is growing from different angles. It's growing from the um, western angle, that's uh, Eleme um, Obigbo axis. It's growing from the northern axis. It's growing from the eastern. So it's important that we control the growth of the city. We regulate the growth of the city, because if we do not do that, then the city is just going to grow in an unstructured manner. And when that happens, it means that you cannot plan. 
and you cannot be able to provide the kind of services you want to provide. So what we want to do now is to concentrate growth in a way that is beneficial rather than just having a spread and a growth without any structure to how it's growing. With the new city under construction, the majority of the populace still live in the old city, many of whom are original occupants who may not be in a hurry to relocate. Taking this into consideration and ensuring that the city does not degenerate further, the state embarked on an urban renewal exercise. Because of the overcrowdedness of Port Harcourt, the city has uh, gone a bit obsolete physically and functionally and even economically. And so the government thought it wise that there is need for things to be turned around. But even in the heat of that, there has to be some preservation and conservation of certain structures, which will make you feel that you are in the old town. So urban renewal itself is about turning the city around, making it look anew. And by that, you can see if you go around the line now, you will see a lot of works going on on the streets, road being tarred, making the town look <laughs> so that if you come from the air, you will see it as a new city altogether. Improving the road network in the old city is a major focus of the urban renewal program, as the existing road network can no longer take the volume of increased traffic. The rate of decay of the old roads was also beginning to hamper the construction of new ones. This is one of two alternative roads being built in the city to ease traffic on the state's major highway called Abba Road. Now this road is called Abolima Woji Road. And uh, this is the first part of it. It has a second segment of it, which is in front. We're going to get to, to that point as we move on. But right now what we're doing here is the construction of the retaining wall to enable us fill this road because this road is built on the, on the swampy part of uh, the state. You can see that everything we have done here is reclamation of, of, of the entire length of this road. And that's why if you look at up there, you will see the, from the black spot on the retaining wall as the indication of where the filling will stop. You can imagine the enormous uh, uh, kind of a filling we are doing on this road. The filling on this road is about two meter. As you can see, the volume of sand that's already here on this road. And if you move up front there, you will see that we have almost completed the Abolima Woji Bridge, which is totally completed. Of course, we have the second bridge up there that we will advance to as soon as we move live here. But basically, this road is to provide an alternative to Abba Road. If you look at what we are doing here, this is a flyover, flying people from Woji through here and terminating on this other road where we are standing. So they can exit out of Port Icon to the east-west road. Mm -hmm. Also, if you are coming from the east-west road, mm -hmm. you can also fly through here mm -hmm. and get back to Woji too. So what we have done here is to ensure that there is no green lock at the end of the day. So that we should take every precaution necessary for us to have a free flowing traffic. And that's what the governor has done on this road. The 8.2 kilometer six lane road and two bridges which cut across several communities will be tolled when completed. The 9.8 kilometer garrison, Trans Amadi, Slaughter, Woji, Elelewon, East West Road is another alternative route which when completed will reduce commuting time in and outside of Port Harcourt. Four bridges will also be constructed along this route. And this one is very critical because it takes traffic from the heart of the town and transfers that traffic into the east-west road. So if you are coming from Akwaibom, we are coming from Cross River State, we are coming from the southeast senatorial district of River State, you have no need to drive on Abar Road. So this will provide an alternative also to Abar Road. This area known as D-Line is a typical example of the development under the Urban Renewal Program. Recognized as one of the areas still bearing a semblance of the urban design of the colonial era, D-Line is gradually losing its signatory look of a well-planned layout owing to bad road networks and drainages. We are presently reconstructing over 
45 roads in all, which covers the entire D line and also uh, part of uh, the state called Oruworoko. Uh, we have done almost all the drains in D line. Uh, on completion of where we are right here, we'll be exiting to Oruworoko to start construction on Oruworoko. When we complete this road, it is a clear urban renewal that we are doing in this part of the city. It is our intention that when this road is completed, we will have a brand new city here in D-Line. Before the expansion of roads and construction of drainage, the government thought it best to alter the building plan of most houses around Port Harcourt. In an area like this, with narrow streets, the high fences that characterize most houses in the city further encroached on the insufficient street space. Now, it's easy for one to see from one end of the street to another. Dr. Araye Okilo owns a hospital here on D-Line. It's been here for over 10 years. Although pleased with the new look, demolishing the high fences came as a rude shock to many. Most people had this fear that it will in, in, uh, uh, increase insecurity. I had that fear initially, but well, the government went on and brought down the fences. And we've not seen, you know, I think the government is a bit justified now because I have not seen any case of armed robbery. I'm, in fact, we're not threatened in any way. So I think the government is right. And I'm enjoying it in actual fact. We enjoy the environment more because in terms of the ventilation, it's been better for us. We noticed that otherwise we are living in the very high fences and it's been difficult except I live in upstairs that can have fresh air, but now it's all over. We are very free. People spent money to build these fences. Waking up in the morning and seeing your fence come down, yes. nobody's going to take that well. Well, um, some people might feel that way, but what I'm saying is that no matter how beautiful the fences were, they were not as beautiful as the houses and the lawns, the flowers surrounding the houses. And when you're outside, you are seeing the houses, you're seeing the beauty of these houses, and you appreciate nature, honestly speaking. This has become the approved height and design for fences in Port Harcourt. While efforts of restoring the old city may be described as insufficient due to the sheer size of the city and the period over which deviation from the city planning was allowed, there are those who believe the ongoing urban renewal and enforcement of the city planning law could make a huge difference. We'll take a short break when Rivers of Possibilities returns. We'll take a look at opportunities that lie in the changing phase of the old Port Harcourt city. Do stay with us. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, you're watching Rivers of Possibilities and on this episode, the focus is on the restoration of the old Port Harcourt city. Now the state water planning isn't left out in the ongoing urban renewal campaign. Its rebranding and renewal strategy began from within. Established in 1991 and formerly known as the River State Water Board, the Port Harcourt Water Corporation was incorporated under the Water Sector Development Law of 2012. The functions of the board include the supply of drinking water to the public, as well as water supply for domestic, industrial and commercial use. Although in existence for two decades, a feasibility study revealed that the state's water system was in dire need of attention. Most homes in Port Harcourt today source their own water with boreholes. The water supply system that the city had was, was developed way back in the 60s um, and um, also built in the 60s. And so there was the need for us as a government to, because there had never been any massive um, development plan for uh, this expanding city. And so no major work has been done since uh, the early 70s. And so this state government decided that we'd look at the city as a whole um, and redesign um, taking into consideration the population explosion in the next um, couple of years to come and having a design horizon of um, the, um, 30 years to ensure that we're able to capture the existing state of the infrastructure, what is required to rehabilitate um, the existing production facilities, what we, we require to extend the existing network, the status of the existing network that we have, 
Um, do we need to rehabilitate? What areas are we extending to? And so we did a comprehensive feasibility study and design for the city. We also looked at the sanitation services. When I say sanitation services, I'm talking about sewage. Um, waste, uh, sewage and waste from uh, water production that we're, we're going to um, actually give the city. Since so inception, access to the funding required to drive these projects was a major challenge. With loans from the World Bank and the African Development Bank, as well as funding from the River State Government, plans to begin the restoration of the first phase of the state's water scheme is underway. The project is a $900 million project, and so after we um, redesigned the entire project, uh, city, um, we found out and we did a feasibility and a status of our existing infrastructure, we, were, we discovered that we only had, out of the 190 kilometers of pipeline that we ex have currently, only 10 kilometers is actually usable. Um, the state of our pipes are old asbestos cement pipes, which um, the integrity is very, very, very um, poor, so we have to change all the pipes. Uh, we literally need to now um, install about 600 kilometers of pipeline for the city to get the city to where it should be. And so um, the amount of infrastructure we have to um, build um, is quite substantial. And so we needed quite a bit of money just to rehabilitate the existing old infrastructure um, and change the existing pipelines and, and um, production facilities. We needed about 350 million US dollars. Um, and so we decided that was just for phase one, the three phases and everything comes to about 900 million dollars. So we decided, okay, we need to look for development funding. We can't do this with funding, uh, the funding that we have. We need to look for long-term funding, development funding, and structure the sector. Um, the sector had also other issues apart from um, just infrastructure because we just look at infrastructure and say you have infrastructure issues, but we have governance issues, we have institutional issues which are also being addressed at the same time. So um, rather than hurriedly go in and change all the pipes, we decided let's look at this sector carefully and we decided to ensure that we have good governance and institutional structure and so we focused on our sector reforms as well. The city of Port Harcourt has been uh, actually mapped and we have them in districts. Uh, so we attack each district according to what we see on ground. And so we have taken aerial pictures of uh, the development on ground and as well put into consideration that we do not want to impact on the people or destruction wise we have to impact on them minimally. And so we try as much as possible to avoid destroying areas. However, the people also have been sensitized that such a project is coming up. We want to give them water. They want water. And so they are anxious. They expect that they should get the water. And so one way or the other, they will allow us to get, into the, uh, get access to them. Port Harcourt, like most parts of Nigeria, is no stranger to pipeline vandalism. To curb this menace, while old pipelines have been restored, a regulatory agency has been established to tackle the issue. By virtue of the Water Sector Development Law of 2012, the Water Board has been commercialised, allowing for players in the private sector to drive services in the state's water scheme. With a thriving population, the role of the private sector to drive distribution and generate revenue is being encouraged. We will attract um, the private sector to come in for that as well as we develop. So we'll start with management contracts and then go into maybe affirmage contracts before we can think of concessioning, which we're looking maybe 20 years down the line. But the whole plan is to have a proper plan, long-term plan for sustainable service delivery. And the key is sustainable service delivery, which is what we're trying to achieve for water supply so that we don't um, have the same issues we have with government institutions that haven't been run properly for the last 30 years and you know, total breakdown with internal systems we're looking at how we could possibly attract local operators and so we're looking at um, breaking down the city into into uh, um, which is in the design already into zones and zones can be managed by s smaller operators when I say smaller operators operators that will handle maybe 20,000 30 40 to 50,000 people at a go in an area and they can manage so we can deliver bulk water to these areas and they will distribute and collect the revenues while they pay for the bulk water so some arrangement like that we could have a management contract with those who are going to operate the station if 
if um, we see the need for that as uh, the project progresses. But these studies will be done carefully, bearing in mind what is on ground, the capacity of the private sector um, to handle um, private sector uh, participation or private public-private partnerships, as the case may be. Opportunities for the private sector go beyond the water scheme. With indiscriminate building of houses in residential and non-residential areas, coupled with road congestion, there is a need for planned and affordable housing in the city. These issues and others are what the new city, known as the Greater Port Harcourt City, hopes to address. With all sides set on occupying the new city, which is currently under construction, a few investors see bigger opportunities in the old city. Mustafa Njay is the MD and CEO of TAF Nigeria Homes. A real estate developer from Gambia, he is optimistic that the old city still has a lot to offer. In collaboration with the River State Government, he's developing 900 housing units on 40 hectares of land in Port Harcourt City. You can never move everybody out into the, into the, into the new city. One, um, uh, people have their roots in here. Uh, so for cultural reasons, they wouldn't abandon you know, their properties and, and move into the new city. So um, there are great opportunities because every city gets rejuvenate, rejuvenated as, with, with gener as generations come in. I mean, some will even be demolished and rebuilt. And there are also pockets of development, pockets of land that are available for development. Uh, for example, what we have done here in the Gulf Estate. Um, there is about, what, 40 hectares of land that was available. And there's also land that can be reclaimed. We need to learn from the Dubai experience. I mean, Dubai is mainly built, the most expensive development is built on, you know, in the sea, out in the water. Okay, obviously River State is river line and there's a lot of water around. So there's a lot of reclamation, rec reclamation that can be done, you know, to expand and rejuvenate the old city. So uh, there is loads of opportunities around in the old city for real estate development. While Port Harcourt is gradually gaining the reputation of being a congested city, Mustafa believes there are lots of untapped potential and resources in the city. But in your opinion, what do you think should be done to check the explosion that is ongoing at the moment? But it's a challenge that every um, um, uh, city goes through, especially in Africa because population has exploded and enforcement is always an issue everywhere so but this, to, the, the answer is that you need to reinforce your envo um, 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 your, your um, um, authority to enforce these ro laws that make up you know or control the development within the city enforcement is actually the answer you know you need to be strict about you know building codes and controls and laws the goal here is to make the houses affordable for buyers. The houses are sold off plan, which means owners have the opportunity of seeing the plan before it is built and can choose from various designs and sites. Introducing a new dimension to housing development, the houses built here will be maintained over time by the realtors. Only 30% of the land has been developed so far. The first phase which will be completed in August, will accommodate 200 housing units. It's not only buildings that make up the city. I mean, we're talking about a garden city. Even like tidying up roads and doing up gardens can make a difference. I mean, uh, rebranding and repainting of, um, um, of, 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 of edifices makes a difference. So you don't have to actually build to bring back the city um, back to its name, uh, the garden city. I mean, um, environmental um, uh, services and, and effects that, you know, within the city can, can make a difference and, and bring back the city to what it was before. As development takes place simultaneously in the old and new cities, the government hopes investors will tap into the opportunities the city offers. Join us on the next edition of Rivers of Possibilities, where we take a look at the state's agricultural sector. You can email us at rivers at abn360.com or drop your comments and suggestions on our Rivers of Possibilities page on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter at rivers of underscore P. I'm Onyi Sunday. Thanks for watching.